Joining us now on the debate in the nation's capital, Steve Applin, VP of Energy and Environment at the HDP Group. And with us here in studio, Gord Miller, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, Deb Doncaster, Executive Director of the Community Power Fund, and Jatin Nathwani, Director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at the University of Waterloo. And it's good to have you guys here in the studio. Steve Applin, nice to see you again in Ottawa. And Steve, why don't I give you the microphone to start with here? Um, well, actually, before you do that, let me remind everybody, sit tight, Steve. This is, we call this Thursday broadcast Your Agenda because we like to get feedback from you. So we want to remind everybody that our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog. He does that every Thursday. That's at tvo.org slash the agenda. You can also pick him up on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash the agenda. Or you can send us a tweet, twitter.com, hashtag your agenda. Jump in, make your comments, and we'll get them up on the screen throughout the broadcast. Okay, now let's go back to Ottawa to Steve Applin. You just heard the interview with Norm Rubin, and I just wondered if there was anything in there, Steve, that you wanted to pick apart. Uh, we're concentrating on a nuclear crisis in Japan that has yet to produce a fatality, as far as I know. You were mentioning the uh, Slate magazine article that pointed out that the only fatality uh, at Fukushima was at another uh, nuclear plant and that it was a crane accident. There hasn't been a single fatality with this. I hope to God that there isn't. Uh, and this is kind of overshadowing a crisis where there are 450,000 refugees who are out in a blizzard uh, facing a very dire, very actually lethal situation. Uh, when all is said and done, I'm pretty confident that this will prove to have been among the least of Japan's worries. You wouldn't know that from the world media headlines. Hmm. And we certainly should not be putting any brakes on any nuclear development here in Ontario. I think the uh, energy minister did exactly the right thing by saying uh, we're going ahead with our plans. <coughs> Deb Doncaster, what did you think? Uh, well, I think uh, we're at a crossroads in Ontario in terms of deciding about what to do with our energy system. Mm -hmm. And for me, the question is, is more about uh, what is the type of energy system that will bring jobs to Ontario, that will minimize risks and health impacts, uh, and that will present an opportunity for the most sort of robust economy in Ontario. Is that nuclear? I don't believe that's nuclear. I believe that's renewable energy. Gotcha. Did she, Jatin? Well, uh, Norm, of course, exaggerates and uh, does it well. And you say, of course, exaggerates. <laughs> and and, and he's, he's entirely eloquent. I agree with Steve that uh, the, if you look at the record of nuclear and nuclear safety uh, over the last 50 years, uh, uh, it is feared more than it, it kills people in, in a, in a, in, from an evidence base, uh, including uh, the Chernobyl disaster, if you want to throw that in as part of the what have been the consequences of nuclear uh, energy generation over the last three, four decades. If you guys don't so, like the headlines about what's coming out of Japan, just wait for the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl, which is coming up, I guess, next month, and we're going to go through this April, all over yeah. again. April, right. Uh, Gord Miller, your comment. Well, I, first of all, I think just for the record's sake, there, it was announced today in the media that people have died from radioactive poisoning in, uh, in Japan, so it's a very regrettable thing. But, but I, I agree to the extent that I don't think this is the time to let that very serious and emotional event uh, you know, create the sphere of policy analysis and judgment that we, we should face when we make these major decisions about our energy future. I mean, it, let's, not, uh, let's not react in a very, very uh, serious and sad event. Uh, uh, so I, I think, you know, going forward, there are some very practical discussions. My big, you know, contribution or, or concern about this is what is the cost of nuclear? We know the cost of wind. We know the cost of solar. They're, they're priced on a, a, a you know, per kilowatt hour basis, mm -hmm. and we know that, but we pay for that. We don't know the price of nuclear. For some reason, it's kept undercover, a uh, secret, even when we recently bid for nuclear plants. I want to see the, you know, per kilowatt hour price of nuclear. I think we know All what it's in. going to cost to build. It's about $26 billion to build what we what Right, but what does that mean in terms of the full operational cost and the life and expected life and say, why don't we cost it the same way? Why don't we have those figures yeah. on the say? But even the $26 billion is, is a reported price, but it has never been confirmed. You are right about that. By that the, is true. Uh, the OPA or, or, or as, as such authority. So what is the full cost? We Let's get it on the table. Go ahead, Steve. We, we do know the cost of nuclear as, as it is generating. We know that the OPG regulated prices of about five and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Bruce, uh, the Bruce B station is getting 5.8 cents per kilowatt hour and Bruce A is getting somewhere in the north neighborhood of seven cents a kilowatt hour. They are, they are the cheapest sources with the exception of hydro we, in the province. But we know we haven't even paid for Darlington. How can we know the price? That's what the regulated cost is. That's what they're getting paid. We know that. But we don't know what the real cost is. 
We, we still got a strand of debt. We haven't station? paid for Darlington yet. And, and if you amortize... The Darlington in, station that exists now, you mean? Well, we're well, sure those are all, all the stations exist now. That's what we're talking. You're comparing, you know, built cost, co infrastructure that was, well, in fact, I was going to say That's paid correct. for years ago, but not paid for years ago, that we still, my children and grandchildren will still be paying for that infrastructure. We, we haven't paid off Darlington. Well, last word to Steve on this, and then I want to broaden the discussion. We, we haven't paid off Darlington uh, in the sense that we haven't paid off the debt retirement charge, but the debt retirement charge isn't 100 percent to Darlington. That's number one. And number two, the debt retirement charge has gone to pay for the non-utility generators. So uh, we have paid for Darlington. The cost of nuclear is demonstrably the low, is much lower than m most of the other sources. Okay, as Certainly we, lower than natural gas, much lower than wind. As we consider what the title of the program we're calling the Green Energy Blues of Ontario today, uh, Let's put it this way. We were, Steve, we were in your neck of the woods at the end of February. We took the agenda on the road. We did an agenda camp. Uh, we asked a bunch of citizens to get together and tell us what they thought the key issues were heading up to the October election campaign. And I don't know whether people around this table would be surprised to hear this. Probably not, but uh, some others might be. Energy. Energy was the number one concern coming out of that conference. And uh, here, I'm going to play a little clip here, an example of... of one of the questions that one of our agenda camp participants had related to the cost of energy. Roll tape, please. Our question was about energy. If elected, what would your government do to assure safe, environmentally friendly, market competitive, affordable and sustainable supply of energy based on scientific research and implemented in a transparent, competitive process? Okay, lots of adjectives there, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's see if we can figure out what the answer to that question is. Uh, this man, Jatin, wants a safe, environmentally friendly, market competitive, affordable, sustainable supply of energy. And my question is, does nuclear do that? Yeah, what we need to try and figure out, and we seem to be stumbling on this, is the idea of what I call the right mix, the right amount at the right price. And what we really need to, to do is, is get at that question. So you can't take an extreme view. It can't be all nuclear. It can't be all wind. And if you, if you land yourself in either one of those corners, you will, you will, you will come up with a solution that doesn't work. So you, you need to understand the notion of mix and amount. And in that part, the, the, the way nuclear plays a role in, in Ontario as a, as a base load generation is well recognized, is an important part of the, of the mix. And particularly the decision we've made in Ontario to get out of coal, we've removed a degree of freedom in, in, in essence in terms of, of planning for the, for the future. So the and if, you, yes. if you take nuclear out of that, then it becomes real trouble. So the, but the answer to this question is yes, nuclear yes. does do this. Yes. Deb, does nuclear do this? Um, you know, I have never looked at it from that perspective because I'm not a nuclear analyst. My interest uh, is particularly around community power and the notion that citizens of Ontario can participate in generating electricity and ec benefit economically from doing so. And I think what I love about renewable energy um, more than anything is that homeowners can put up solar panels, churches can put up solar panels, farmers can put up biogas digesters, communities can build wind farms and participate and be the economic beneficiaries of renewable energy and energy generation in Ontario. It's not so easy for citizens to band together to build a nuclear power plant or a gas plant or a big large well, that's plant. That's true. All right, but Steve, let me try this with you. Is nuclear energy cheaper to generate than, say, wind energy? By far. Look, look at the uh, situation we have in Ontario today. If you're a wind generator, you need 13 and a half cents per kilowatt hour just to make it worth your while. Otherwise, it's you cannot compete in the market. And the reason for that is you're competing against large-scale, cheaper sources. That's hydro and nuclear. Uh, nuclear is demonstrably uh, the second and third cheapest, and I'm going by uh, stations here between OPG and Bruce Power, it's the second and third cheapest source of power in the province. Wind is at 13 and a half cents, is almost double the most expensive nuclear that we have. Okay, but Steve, you're, not including, it, the this is, you're not including the sticker shock of building the thing in the first place though, right? Uh, I think that that does include the sticker shock, shock of building the thing in the first place. We, we already paid for those nuclear plants with rates that are similar to what we have today. Okay, let's go around we've, the table and, here. Gordon? Yeah, we, we've always had... Sorry, let me just get Sorry, Gord on, on this issue of whether nuclear energy is cheaper to generate than wind, and then we'll come around for a second round. Clearly, we don't know the price of nuclear energy, what it costs to generate. We did, you're, you're comparing built nuclear plants that, that I would say have not been paid for because of the stranded debt, and that they're existing old technology, you can't compare that against new. Uh, we, we don't lend any money to the, to the wind 
you know, producers to, we don't give them the money. We only pay them 13 and a half cents when the electricity is generated. That's the deal. What's the price we have to pay to nuclear power plants? We don't give them $26 billion. We, we say, we'll pay you a price per kilowatt hour delivered, 20 year or 30 year contract like hydro. I'm in any day. If you can do it for 13 and a half cents or cheaper, I'm, I'm for it. But that's not the way it but works. But that's not the way it works. Okay, Justine? Let me help clarify here. Uh, this $26 billion a sticker shock and so on, what you really have to do is understand the concept of what is called levelized unit energy cost is the only basis on which you can actually make comparisons between different energy options. And on that basis, the answer is relatively clear and obvious that nuclear does come out cheaper uh, than wind. And the other point I wanted to add here was that wind generation at the 13 and a half or whatever the number is, is, is generation cost. But the cost to the system, the fact that you also then have to integrate it because it happens to be distant from uh, uh, load risk, from where, where the power is required, adds a certain amount of cost that could range anywhere from three to five cents a kilowatt hour and so on. So there are huge integration costs that you need to keep in mind. That's not to say we shouldn't do wind in Ontario, by the way, but to put that in perspective, you've got to get it on a levelized unit energy cost basis and you've got to understand integration costs as part of it. Deb. Um, well, I guess I'm wondering why it is so obvious that, that we would say that nuclear is, by, is cheaper. It's just a proven case. I mean, my understanding is that Poor's and Standards and Moody's put nuclear at 16 cents a kilowatt hour or 18 cents a kilowatt hour, whereas Ontario is paying 13 and a half cents a kilowatt hour for wind. So I'm not sure that everybody thinks it's obvious that nuclear is the cheaper option. The second thing is, uh, and with respect to the renewables in Ontario right now, the way the feed-in tariff program works, it's a very transparent process for setting a price for energy. So essentially the government said, what does it cost to put a wind turbine into the system? And we will pay that price plus a reasonable return on investment and we'll set the kilowatt hour price at that. The word reasonable is what's getting kicked around these days. Well, I think, but if yeah. you were to subject nuclear or gas plants or any type of larger central fossil fuel plant to that same level of transparency, I would be very curious to see what number you would come up with. Okay, let me try this. We, we talked in the earlier interview about the fact that there are many other countries around the world now that are you know, pausing. They're considering how much of their nuclear bill they will want to still go forward with. And we're going to have hearings in this province as well, I think starting next week, about what to do about Darlington as well. Uh, okay, Gordon Miller, what should, uh, uh, do you get to testify at those hearings? Nope, no, I, I deal with them after. You deal after with the after the fact. Made, yeah. Should we be considering putting a hold on any future nuclear build in this province? No, I don't think so. I think we, we, we got to have a frank and honest discussion. You, 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 in your little summary, you left with the word transparent, which was the uh, the, the person on the screen uh, okay. suggested was one of the adjectives necessary. And I think it's the transparency. We want to have a free and open discussion on full costs and, and let's get this on the table. I don't think we should delay. I think we should have that discussion. Steve, how about it? Um, should we go ahead with new units at Darlington? Of course we should go ahead with new oh, units at Darlington. No that reconsideration at all? Be... No reconsidering given what's happened this week? No, we, should, we, should, we shouldn't be making, we shouldn't jump off a ship just because there's a ship two oceans over that's in trouble. We've got, we don't have um, the same kind of problems. They've gone through an unprecedented natural disaster, a huge earthquake, powerful earthquake and a tsunami. Uh, why should we cancel plans because they've gone through an absolutely unique event? Chatin? What we have is an environmental assessment hearing process that has begun to start. And perhaps it is actually the place where the issues of as cost as, as, as we're debating here should be aired out. And in addition, the, in light of the circumstances in Japan and lessons that we may learn from it, and if there are other things that we might want to do differently and so on, there's always a time for pause and think and so on. But this particular hearing, they have the authority to call any evidence. They are a decision-making quasi-judicial body that will may, uh, review the evidence. So it's a perfect place, really, to air all these issues out and, and, and uh, as, as you say, make it transparent. Okay, let's just let everybody know that while we're having this discussion here in the studio and in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, it's happening online as well. And our Mike Miner has been moderating the chat on our website, tbo.org slash the agenda. Mike, come on in and tell us what folks are saying. Sure, there's a lot of discussion online about what the options are for power generation in Ontario to meet our needs going forward. Uh, Kathy from Kitchener-Waterloo uh, pretty much summarizes one perspective where she thinks that uh, solar and wind can help us avoid the cost and health concerns of coal, um, that green is really uh, a cure-all. Uh, but you also have skepticism. Someone uh, named September Dawn wrote in the blog that the only green element of the energy uh, 
of the green energy industry is the money. Uh, and people are questioning whether or not uh, nuclear reactors can be built on time at cost. They're asking the same questions about the green options and whether they can deliver enough energy and whether they can do that reliably. Uh, someone named Bytor wanted to uh, bring up looking at the byproducts of the electronic industry and solar cells. He thinks there are serious environmental questions around there. And the, the phrase transparency came up, and that's actually a real difficulty that people are expressing because they're having trouble wrapping their heads around the number. Uh, Chris Tyndall, who uh, ran for the Green Party, has been a guest on the program, said that it's uh, not seeing the true costs of solar and nuclear, et cetera, due to direct and indirect subsidies, all sorts of things. It's very hard for them to compare, and the people at home who want to try and figure this out sometimes feel like they're perhaps not really getting the right bite on the facts. Okay, Mike, thanks for that. You keep moderating away. TVO.org slash the agenda if people want to get in and contribute. Uh, the word green came up there. Color of your shirt, St. Patrick's Day. Perfect That's day right. to talk yeah. about it. Uh, what do you want to talk about the money? I about? want to talk about the, the, the cost. Of, let, let's talk, there's been lots of poor information. I want, you know, disinformation out there about costs. We've been on the program before. I, I've got the numbers now. I had my staff, you know, seek the numbers and calculate it Numbers out. of what? Uh, numbers. Cost per kilowatt hour, all in, typical. 13 cents per kilowatt hour for a homeowner in Ontario, say the GTA. That's how the typical one. Of that, how much is the cost, the current cost of renewables the, and, and uh, conservation programs <coughs> added together? Price, 0 0.4 cents of the 13 cents is going for conservation and renewables. That's the current cost. Will it go up in the future? It will, but not that much. And, but that's the reality of what we're talking about. So this, there's, they've been trying to sell this idea that, you know, that you know, wind and solar are bankrupting us at these, at these high rates. They are a small, small portion of the uh, overall generation capacity of this province, 0 0.4 cents. Gotcha. Deb and then Jatim. Yeah, I think uh, I went back and looked at the long-term energy supply plan for uh, Ontario today and looked at that exact question. Of what is causing the rate increases right now that people are on the, see on their hydro bill that are saying are, are as a result of the Green Energy Act? I'll and tell you it, what they think it is. I know. They think it's 80 cents per kilowatt hour being paid right. to people to put up exactly. you know, photovoltaics exactly. all over the but place. But the fact of the matter is between 20, 2003 and 2010, very few solar panels have been built or in the system during that time. And the actual increases uh, of renewables between 2003 and 2010 are 2%. The real increases between 2003 and 2010 uh, are attributable to gas, oil, and nuclear, which, which have grown and increased by 17%. So it's, that's so what's contributing. The so don't, don't blame the renewables. We haven't seen saying. the impact of the Green Energy okay. Act yet on hydro rates. Jatim? And I agree with Gordon and, and Deb on this question. The fact that uh, the renewables today constitute a very small proportion of the mix, and therefore there is not a significant cost impact within the system. Fair enough. But the real relevant question is, if you are going to have, say, 82 cents uh, solar power, uh, and that it begins to assume a very large proportion of penetration into the system, then, of course, there will be a corresponding increase in cost related to that. So it's a proportionality issue. Deb, I have a simple question. Sure. Is nuclear energy environmentally friendly? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think that the incidents in Japan would suggest that it's not. The incidents in Chernobyl would suggest that it's not. And I think, again, it goes back to the question about black and white. It's nothing is pure. And I think it's a question of extreme and what kind of risks as a society we're prepared to live with. And I think if you look at solar panels and you look at biogas digesters and hydro plants and windmills, they are so relatively safe compared to the potential for a nuclear disaster that it seems almost funny that we're putting them both under the same brush of green. Steve, how would you answer the question? Uh, I would look at it this way. Uh, all the renewables that Deb just mentioned uh, and especially wind and especially solar require massive uh, backup from a fossil fuel source. That fossil fuel is not going to be coal because we're phasing it out. It's going to be natural gas. Well, after the show is over, your viewers can go to the, uh, to go to the internet and type in, in Google the term natural gas explosion. And when they see the page after page after page of incidents come up where people have been killed in natural gas explosions, come back and say that nuclear is not the safest by far. Uh, um, the uh, uh, person from Waterloo mentioned at the beginning that uh, nuclear has been very safe on this continent. In the entire OECD, there has been one fatality in the history of the civilian nuclear industry. It is demonstrably by any objective measure, any statistical measure, by far the safest and cleanest of these sources. Deb? I think uh, you, 
you know, the, the, the whole notion of energy security and energy independence is, is a useful term to think about right now when we're talking about our energy future. Ontario is blessed with an abundance of hydropower, wind power, and a, an amazing solar regime that's comparable to, to California. And yet we have a relatively low popu population density and a relatively low demand. If you look at a country like Germany, they have 32,000 megawatts of installed renewable capacity today, and they're a country one third the size of Ontario. Mm -hmm. We have, and we have so much hydropower. So we have a huge amount of capacity to, to bring you know, a stable, reliable energy mix into Ontario through renewables. And sure, if we need to have gas peaker plants or we need to have gas, we need to have gas cogen, we can implement that on an as needed basis. So I think it's, uh, we have to look at what we have as an economy and as a society. And Ontario is blessed with an abundance. Gord, let me go to you on this one. And I want to get back to that original question that Guy Annabel asked off the top of the program where he asked for a safe, environmentally friendly, market competitive, affordable, transparent, and sustainable supply of energy. Can renewables do that for us? It's a mix, and I think that's... That uh, sounds like a no. It well, sounds what, like it, re renewables yes, well, can't with, do renewables it. Renewables with, with hydro in, hydro in with storage, yes. But it's a, it's a, a major change, and I'm not uh, one to say that we're going to... I don't suggest abandoning the nuclear program. I believe that's 50% you know, of our power right now. Can it be done uh, if we wanted to? Yes, because you have to put storage into the system. Because obviously the sun doesn't shine at night, the wind doesn't always blow. And, but, but you can produce enough energy and you can store it and feed it back in when you need it. But that's a complete restructuring of the energy system. Mm -hmm. Certainly feasible. Even when the sun isn't shining and even when the wind isn't blowing, do those renewables have the capacity to create enough power that we could save it as baseline and use it when we need it which would therefore obviate the need to build more nuclear reactors. This has been the fundamental challenge and people who operate the system need to understand it well and, and everyone else should try to understand it. The problem with renewables, the intermittency and, and so on is, is well known. Storage, we talk of storage, but where is the storage going to come from? There is pumped storage, it's geographically dependent and it really, there is no cheap storage <coughs> available for, for uh, the system to operate. So are you uh, saying no? No. The answer is the renewables cannot uh, on its own provide a kind of service to the society that you need. They have to be part of a mix and they have to play perhaps an increasing role but they cannot, they cannot uh, without... Quebec does it Gordon with hydro. And yeah. Quebec? They do what with hydro? They power their entire, almost virtually their entire electrical demand with, with hydroelectric power. That's because they've got a huge piece of land with lots of water at one end and, and uh, they still control the territory that's below that. We don't. We've tapped out our hydro. We've tapped. we uh, hydro provides a quarter of our uh, system, uh, a quarter of our electricity. That's why we built coal plants. That's why we built nuclear plants because our population grew, the load grew, and we could not meet it with hydro. Deb, what about it? Can can renewables get us to where we need to yeah, in terms of baseline power? I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, we may have tapped out on large hydro sites, but there were over 500 small hydro sites decommissioned when nuclear power came online in Ontario. I mean, the potential for, for small hydro, medium-sized hydro, new innovations in hydro, wind power, solar power, biogas, we don't have that much demand in Ontario. Um, we don't have the population density in Ontario such that we have to build a massive amount of power. And plus, we have a huge, huge province that has a huge amount of capacity. Uh, you know what? I th I th I, you know, I'm not trying to dispute what you're saying, but I will note that we've had emails come up on the screen throughout the course of the broadcast, and here's another one up there right now, where people are doubting that wind and solar are going to be available often enough to do the job. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's about keeping the lights on. Mm -hmm. how, how do you convince people that wind and solar will get us there when clearly many people are not convinced of that yet? Well, I think, as Gord said, until we build enough that can get us there, where there's massive amounts contributing to a system, you use storage, you use gas as peaker plants, you use CHP. There are intermediary technologies that we can put in place. But we're 25, 30 years away from having wind and solar being a part of the mix in a percentage that you'd like to see? Is no, not right? at all. I not think that far? No, I think with the Green Energy Act, there's no cap on the amount of renewables that can be put into the system right now. It's a question of how quickly the market can respond and how quickly people want to develop their projects. Jatine? Let me help explain. Let's say, if, uh, you mentioned Germany, you've got 30,000 megawatts of w wind generation capacity. Capacity factor of wind tends to be a third, so you're effectively delivering 10,000 megawatts. But if you then this is on an average annual basis. If you then ask the question, at peak hour when you actually need it, 
how much of that capacity is really there, and you come down to around 8, 10, 12 percent. So the real effective capacity delivered on the system from the installed capacity base is actually very low. In Ontario, we have 1,000. Uh, by the time, if you say we're going to have a 6, 10,000 megawatt system, uh, will it really deliver effective 10,000 megawatts capacity or not? The answer is no. no. Let's get into th uh, this angle on the wind story. Uh, January 24th, a couple of months ago, a group of wind farm opponents announced they were going to sue the government of Ontario because of what they said were health effects because of wind turbines. Case was thrown out of court. However, before it was, the government, in its wisdom, decided to make the announcement that they were going to stop offshore wind farms in their tracks right now. No further development there. Deb, why do they do that? Uh, well, I think that they did that because they recognized that there were some projects that were being built in areas that would be particularly problematic for them with the election coming up. So strictly a political decision? Um, I think it was largely that. I think it was also that if you look at a lot of jurisdictions with huge amounts of wind, you start with onshore wind and then you progress at, on an as-needed basis to offshore wind because offshore is more expensive. So I think it was an actually a prudent decision to make because we still have so much onshore capacity that we have to develop. Steve, how much science and how much political science went into that decision do you think? It was probably all poli uh, politics. I don't think that they were responding to the, the uh, health concerns of, of wind power. I think that everybody who, is, who has got access to an internet and a spreadsheet and a few hours of free time and who's walking through this global adjustment uh, figures that the IESO, the Independent Electricity System Operator, publishes, are looking at these numbers and saying, this absolutely doesn't make any economic sense. We're paying huge amounts of... Gord and Deb both said that the amount of, of, of actual energy that is provided by these renewables is quite minuscule. That's true. They are occupying 66% of the, of the total payments to the global adjustment. The global adjustment is this cost recovery. That is what's driving up our costs. People are looking at this information on the Internet and saying this makes such little economic sense. Why are we doing this? The government is putting in wind for political reasons. They're backing off wind for a pushback from other political sources. Gordon Miller, you want to comment on that? Which, which point? The original question <laughs> about the offshore wind or this point? Let, let's start with the how much science, how much political science was in the decision to stop the offshore wind farms. Well, strangely enough, I've really looked into this, and uh, the, the minister said to me and to the public that, uh, that in fact, he responded to the fact that there were uh, 1,400 comments to the uh, posting on the Environmental Bill of Rights Ministry of the Environment posting, and another 500 on the Ministry of Natural Resources posting on this topic. And uh, he said there were questions raised uh, that, were, that couldn't be answered uh, with the science available in this unit. So, uh, as is my job, I have people looking at that. Now, it's, we're not quite finished yet, but I'll tell you, there have been questions raised. There, he, the minister was, was honest and correct. Uh, so there were questions raised he didn't have the answers to, things about the effect on the radar systems and complex questions that the answers were not obvious. So there is more need, research needed for those the large offshore developments to be done. Some people, though, have come forward with studies which they say prove that there are harmful health effects uh, from wind farms too close to homes. Have I, you been I go with the Medical Officer of Health of Ontario who said there is, there is no, no, no health problem. The Medical Officer of Health is the authority and I have to defer to, uh, to that authority. To her. You wanted to say? I just wanted to say that uh, I think it's, you can't both say that the government's building wind because it's politic and they're cancelling wind because it's politic. <laughs> Right. So I think that it, it, what, what I want to, yes, what I want to stand by Steve, <laughs> let me make I, the point and then you come back. I mean, I think that there's this idea that the Green Energy Act is just, uh, it's just a brand or it's something that's just being marketed because it's politically popular. The Green Energy Act was the result of a, a massive grassroots initiative by a whole bunch of Ontario residents and citizens groups from First Nations, farm organizations, rural organizations, local economic development groups local community power organizations, churches, faith groups, you name it, got together and said, we're at a crossroads in Ontario, we have to rebuild our, our electricity system and are we going to do it in a way that is sustainable and that is economic, that allows us to participate and to benefit, or are we not going to do that? Okay, and it was those people that, that brought the idea of a Green Energy Act to this government to implement. Steve, you want to come back on that? The, well, I won't deny that there's a community element to it, but there's, there's just uh, there's economics that uh, tracks into it as well. If you drive out into a rural area in anywhere in this province, into a poor, impoverished rural area, you don't see solar panels and you don't see windmills, you see the grid. 
There's a reason for that. That is because the central station grid model, it's been much maligned. It is the cheapest and most efficient way to deliver power to millions of consumers across a far-flung province like Ontario. Uh, there, so there's, uh, there's, uh, it's clashing with economics as well. The political push for green energy, uh, there's a lot, there are mainstream environmental groups that pushed hard for that. And there are some mainstream environmental groups that are working with natural gas and uh, natural gas is a beneficiary of this. Because like I said, you have to have a fossil source to back this up. It's not going to be coal, it's got to be gas. That's why you have an Enbridge wind farm north of Bruce Power. Shatim, let me try this with you. You know, clearly at one point, all of those groups that came forward that Deb just listed, they made their case to the Premier of Ontario. And Dalton McGuinty thought about it and obviously decided that he wanted to plant his flag with the Green Energy Act. Uh, that he decided he wanted to make this the cleanest, greenest jurisdiction in all of North America in terms of energy going forward. Yeah. Is that a good decision? It's a mixed decision from my standpoint. I think the Green Energy Act has a certain number of merits, and, and Deb, as she pointed out, has there's a lot of value in, in, in trying to get this economic development angle uh, as part of the energy system development. That ought to be there. Ontario has always had that, uh, if you go back the last 100 years. Uh, in, in the development of the system. So that part, I think, is a pretty fair. The, the relevant question is that the tariffs, as they're set, and some of the devil is in the detail, and will it actually really deliver the kind of net economic benefit to the province over the long term? It's an open question in my mind, and, and that uh, it's, again, subject to review the tariffs and so on, and whether they will actually deliver the goods. Now, we should just clarify, Gord, you don't work for the Premier of Ontario. I do not. You no. are appointed by the legislature of Ontario. Right. You work for the legislature. All we're the people. Commonly, I'm critical of the Premier of Ontario. You, you are indeed. And uh, so let me get you to weigh in on the question I just asked Jatine, which is, we've seen where the Premier has planted his flag. Do you think it was a good decision? I think it was a good decision. You know, remember, for all the fuss and bother, and I go back to this point, it's 0 0.4 cents of the 13 cents. That's what it's cost us. That's the extent of the gamble or the, the huge initiative we've taken in this province. Uh, it is, it, we are very much still uh, the original system, a centralized generation with a half nuclear, another you know, quarter or so uh, hydro and a, and a whole bunch of gas. Uh, and the, the renewable energy is a new thing. It's a small thing. Well, why and do it we does have give us something and gives us a, a, a technology, an opening, an opportunity. And, and right now it is small potatoes in the scheme of then things. Then why do we have the impression that it is the renewables, the solar, the wind, that is the reason behind why our you know, energy prices allowed, are so because, high? Because we allow these, these falsehoods to be perpetrated. We go back to this, this 80 cent figure that is so often repeated in the media and by uh, And I pundits. did it again tonight. And you did it again tonight. 80 cents is for a very small sliver of very tiny solar. If you have a little, you know, a, a relatively small solar panel on a farm, or, that's the only thing that qualifies. The regular big solar things are 42 cents. And I don't think they're offering 80 anymore no. anyway, are they? Yeah, no, that's, that's right. off the table now. Jatine? But, but would, you, would you agree that if that 80 cents or 60 cents solar, ground-mounted solar, for example, if it had 10,000 megawatt capacity in Ontario, that it would not have any impact on the price of, of the... But of the well, it's not 10,000 megawatt. No, no, but if it were, if, if that's the whole point. If, the fact that it doesn't you're exist right now... going for a now, big renewable target. Yeah. If you're going for a big renewable target, it becomes a large part of the system, the cost will go up. If, if you, yeah, but the, if, but you if you set system, it at those rates, the largest solar farm in, in the world is in Ontario. It's it's 80 megawatts. Where is okay. it? It's in Sarnia, Sarnia. just outside okay. of Sarnia, and I've been there. It's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, but and and it doesn't get 80 cents. It when gets it, 42 cents. It gets 42. Steve, come on in. That's that's just, that's just my point. If if we're if we're aiming for a big renewables target, we're going to be paying much more. But we don't have to aim for a big renewable target and just to see what the effect is going to be. As I said, the IESO publishes gl the global adjustment figures, which are the cost recovery between the market price of power and, what, and the contracted price of power. The, what I call the politically correct sources, I don't want to denigrate them, but that's what they are. The politically correct renewables uh, uh, are occupying 66% of the uh, absolute dollar value that's of the global adjustment. That's more than OPG. No, it's not wrong. That's, that's OPG. Why do you say it's wrong? That's, that's wrong. I got that's the more figures. than OPG. I got the figures. It's... Okay, he says that. What do you say? I, I say it, it, the the total of conservation and renewables is is only thirty percent of the of the, uh, the global adjustment for the OPA. Deb's going to break the tie. <laughs> I, I'm not commenting. Not. I'm not going to comment on the global adjustment. I guess I just want to ask, you know, what uh, are are is it worldwide known that the cost of nuclear are going up or down, and because it is worldwide known that the costs of renewables are coming down, 
So I don't under, for me, you know, it's what, what are the current costs and what are the future costs of these different technology types going to be? Renewables are always coming down. They've been coming down for a decade. And we don't have fuel costs. We don't have mining costs. We don't have all of these ongoing costs associated with those types of technologies. I got about a minute and a half to yeah. go here. You Let me ask to, you this. You, yes. Do okay. you think energy policies become too politicized in Ontario? It has. <laughs> I'm you, Sadly you can, so. You, you can offer a little longer answer than that if you want. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it ought not to become that. Uh, we need to take an arm's length view, leave it to the authorities like the Ontario Power Authority and designated agencies to plan for in a systematic way uh, how we should really organize our system. George, you want the last 30 seconds? Too political? It's, I mean, it's been political since Adam Beck you know, yes. created Ontario yeah, Hydro. It, it is too political, but I think I would like to see you know real facts on the table, lots of transparency, and let the, let the public Ontario participate and let's, let's decide what we want to do. And, and I think if we did that, we'd have a very intelligent discussion, come to something that the uh, people in Ontario would become very comfortable with. I think they're going to decide in October, aren't they? Well, they may, but, but that would be a political decision. That would indeed, but there will be an election. <laughs> and uh, I suspect this issue may come up. Thanks, everybody, for doing this program tonight. Steve Applin, in our nation's capital from the HTP Group. Gord Miller, the Environmental Commissioner for Ontario. Deb Doncaster, Community Power Fund. Jatin Nathwani from the University of Waterloo. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.